Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank the studio for hosting us. Um, and also a huge thank you to Bill Rogers, who's helping with the logistics and also, of course, my sanity. Um, and I love all of our Lunch and Learns, but I have to be honest that this is actually the session that I am most excited about this semester. Because um, you're going to get to learn about federal funding from two, what I suspect are going to be two very different perspectives, but they're both very successful. So it's really cool and exciting to have them here. These are your colleagues, Professor Vivian Loftness and Professor Golan Levin. He's, Golan is joining us at the front now. Um, so they will each share brief presentations on their experiences, and then we're going to open it up for questions, which I think is going to be a really um, valuable afternoon for you. So one logistical note is that there is a class in the studio after our event, and they need to turn the room over. So we'll want to make sure that we end on time, and then you can move your post-event convos to the Great Hall, perhaps, um, to allow for that to take place. Um, so first up, yes? Nico would like to say one thing. Just to say who we are and where we are. You're in the studio for Creative Inquiry. We have many um, grants and, and different ways to support your creative research, so please um, get in touch with me if you have any questions, but you know, check out our website. There's a link that says grants. You can apply for the Further Fund grant or the Steiner grant, Further Fund for research projects, Steiner for outside guests coming to you, but there's other things we can do. We can also host workshops and events and lectures and all kinds of things, and you can get on our email list, and you can come to those things. Um, so that's where you are. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. Um, so our first speaker today will be Professor Vivian Loftness, and Vivian is the Paul Mellon Chair and University Professor at Carnegie Mellon University former head of the Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. She's an internationally renowned researcher, author, and educator with over 40 years of experience in building science research for industry and government, in addition to editing the 2013 and 2020 Springer Encyclopedia on Sustainable Built Environments. She has authored books, research reports, and chapters on climate and regionalism in architecture, environmental design and sustainability, advanced building systems integration, and design for performance in the workplace of the future to enhance productivity, health, and the triple bottom line. She served on over 25 board of directors, including the US Environmental Protection Agency, the National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology, the DOE, Department of Energy, Federal Energy Management Advisory Committee, and the National American Institute of Architects. Um, and there are even further awards should you visit her bio online. Um, but in the interest of time, let's welcome Professor Vivian Loftness. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me start by saying uh, I have a lot of years of experience, which is why I have a long CV. Hopefully nobody's overly intimidated by people reading off your CV. Um, I, I actually don't represent an individual. I represent an entire group of individuals, and I really want to make the point. Uh, I reside in the, in the Intelligent Workplace, which is on the roof of Maggie Mo. For those of you who haven't had a chance to come up there, please come up. Uh, it is a living laboratory, but it's also the residence of about eight to 10 faculty and somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, PhD students. And so it's, it's, a, it's a living lab. It's about 7,000 square feet on the roof of Maggie Mo. Um, we, have, we have a center, and there are only so many centers in the College of Fine Arts. Uh, this particular one's called the Center for Building Performance and Diagnostics. And it, is, uh, it has been heavily federally, federally funded and industry funded over about a, um, almost a 40-year period. Uh, it also offers uh, master's and PhD degrees. And, and so we've been privileged to be able to work with graduate students on these research projects. I just want to emphasize I am not representing just the work of myself. Um, I'm part of a team. At when we, in our really strong period, we were eight faculty, all dedicated to the area of high performance buildings and sustainability. We're down to five. We have two that might retire. We're going to be down to three. I'm a little panicked here about what happens to the area of expertise. Of course, sustainability has become so pervasive in the last decade that you know maybe there's a different type of, of infrastructure that could be built around the area of sustainability and high performance buildings. 
So I thought I would just give you a sampling of the projects that we've had federal funding for. The very first project that we got funded was the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a much more traditional funding stream for uh, the College of Fine Arts and, and even the School of Architecture. Uh, we, we, were, we had the luxury of about $50,000 to study at museums around the world. It was a super project. We traveled, we spent time in museums, and we, the, the focus of the study was on architecture for art's sake, on how you actually design buildings for the art. And we, we actually developed a concept called vantage point design, where you're designing from different vantage points, not just from the, the uh, first time viewer or the repeat viewer, but from the perspective of the curator and the, and the director and, the, um, and, and the, the actual artists themselves, and what would they want as a physical environment. And we argued that there was not the perfect museum, but that every museum actually had elements that were far better suited to the display of art and so we actually developed 50 criteria and said, look, you need to design floors and ceilings, and you need to design the layout of buildings and the amenities in museums differently, and you need to learn from a lot of museums, not just from one or two. Wonderful project, really fun. Um, and from there, we started, uh, and this, a lot of this work is, is the work of Volker Hartkopf, who's now an emeritus and was the director of the center. Um, Volker had funding from the USAID, uh, and the Department of State uh, to actually work on indigenous um, low uh, self-help housing uh, and um, small building construction techniques in, in really stressed climate zones. And so um, the projects range from Bangladesh where they were flood prone using bamboo and how do you do self-help housing uh, in, a, in a flood prone environment to earthquake resistant Adobe construction in Peru, and so uh, he took teams of students, including Steve Lee, who's in one of these photographs, uh, to help build buildings um, in flood-prone and earthquake uh, zone using indigenous uh, materials. And these, these projects, and I put the budgets here so you, you know, uh, it was two different projects, about 200,000 each, uh, to help support both the research and, and uh, methodologies it, it, it ended up with a series of publications as well as workshops with indigenous uh, teams learning how to build. Um, at one point in time, uh, the mayor of Pittsburgh, uh, Kalajiri, asked Volker, why in the hell are you doing work in Bangladesh and uh, in Peru uh, for populations that are uh, distressed when we have populations that are distressed in the United States? Why aren't you doing work right here in the city of Pittsburgh? And he said, well, we could. We could do infill housing in distressed neighborhoods, which is the South Oakland house on the left. Uh, the, the mayor came up with $50,000, and then uh, there were we, matching funds were key, which came, uh, in, in this case, from the Department of Energy and Housing and Urban Development, which led to a bigger project in Manchester um, uh, on the north side to do not only a whole series of infill houses, but to take some old distressed buildings and turn them back into viable rental housing. And so both of these projects were in underserved neighborhoods, and they are extremely low energy buildings. I, one of our um, secretaries, Darlene Covington Davis, lived in one of these houses, and she basically said her entire energy bill, the entire time she lived there was $50 a month for both electricity and gas because it was such an incredibly, and it, it just comfort levels were extremely high. Um, then we, Volker came up with an idea that we were all wrapped up in, all eight faculty, uh, called the Advanced B Building Systems Integration Consortium. And I do think that if you guys have work that you're thinking might be uh, collaborative across several disciplines, not just only in CFA, but disciplines across campus, that you may want to try to see if you can gather together multiple funders. So the idea behind this consortium was to get people who were making products for um, commercial buildings and people and, and federal agencies that were actually uh, designing and operating commercial buildings to pitch in $50,000 a year each with a five-year commitment to actually doing research on what is the office of the future. What, is sustainable, what are sustainable offices of the futures? And so all of a sudden we had somewhere between the lowest, I think at one point, this went on for at least 12 years, the lowest number was eight members and the highest number was probably 12 members, each pitching in 50,000, which gave us a 
real working capital to support master's and PhD and faculty summer salaries so that we could actually do work on the Office of the Future. And one of the jobs we did was to travel the world and look at what is the Office of the Future in Japan, what is the Office of the Future in France, in the UK, in Canada, in Germany. And it was really an amazing uh, series of presentations back to industry and government about this is what Germany thinks the Office of the Future is. And we were hosted by amazing um, leaders around the world and helped write a book for John Wiley and then wrote a series of research reports. And it was really an amazing project. Gave us a sustained, the university actually gave us a, an overhead break, which was huge. We were literally working on a 12% overhead rather than the 56% overhead. Because of the way it was structured, I don't know if we'll ever get this again. Um, anyway, it allowed us again to have resources to support graduate students. A couple of sort of one-off projects that resulted from this consortium where people said, wait a minute, we want you to do a piece of work for us. Because the consortium was group work. We were doing work for everybody that pitched in. But sometimes people said, no, we want you to do a piece. So Searle, which is the Corps of Engineers in Champaign, Illinois, uh, a division of the Department of Defense, said, you know, if we gave you 50,000, would you work on a master plan that would be sustainable for our campus? And so we did that. Um, and it was really an interesting project. It actually led to doing master planning work for Volkswagen in Wolfsburg, Germany. I mean, we were really able to start looking at what is the sustainable planning process for communities. Um, the State Department, who was a member of the, con of the larger consortium, said, you know, we'd like you to run a series of workshops for our AEC teams on the embassies and consulates that we're building. So they would bring to the Intelligent Workplace in Carnegie Mellon the architects of record, the engineers of record, the construction teams of record, and of course the, the uh, Department of State leaders who were managing and, and, and um, leading those buildings to run a series of facilitated workshops. And we would present to this group, this is what the Office of the Future is, and this group would go back and start to think about how they might want to design differently from what they've been doing for other embassies and consulates. And this particular one is more Rubel Udell. They are the architects who did the Tepper. Uh, school here, and uh, they designed the Berlin Embassy, and were here in a in a work a, a facilitated charrette with all of their team, trying to advance a few steps in sustainability. I mean, today sustainability is in every professional firm, so I'm not sure we would be able to attract this kind of an activity today because they already have internalized in their own firms all sorts of expertise, but facilitated charrettes with, with academic leadership is actually valuable as a way of bringing people from the private sector into an institution, and in this case, with a federal client. Um, we were also um, asked by the General Service Administration to help them build their own intelligent workplace laboratory in Washington, D.C., on the seventh floor of the headquarters building that's a block from the White House and from AIA uh, headquarters. And so uh, they, it's called the Adaptable Workplace. Oh, this is not it, though. Sorry. Let me switch. I'll come back to it. Sorry. I, my eyesight's not good enough from this distance. I'll come back to the Adaptable Workplace Lab. Um, OK, so the consortium slowly began to ebb away. And 2008 was a killer year, as you know, economically. And a lot of the, uh, uh, the industries that were funding us said, you know, financially, we're going to have to hold for a couple of years. So things got to be a little rough. The Department of Energy put out a call for um, consortium of universities and private industries uh, with competition open to the entire country for a million dollars a year for, f or no, f $5 million a year for, f for th uh, five years of research funding to advance energy efficiency in the built environment. The competition was fierce. People were bonding together. Penn State led a group that included us, it included New Jersey Institute of Technology, it included um, MIT, it included a whole host of Northeastern academic and industries. And we competed against a huge real powerhouses that included the California Energy Commission and the entire West Coast clan. Uh, the New York State competed against us and we won. We were like the little players in the room, maybe because we were the little players in the room. Um, and so for five years, we ran a hub, an energy hub, 
where we were a critical piece of it. Of course, it was a much bigger hub than us. Penn State was the lead. They funneled the money to us. It was probably a pain in the neck to manage us, uh, you know, co the contracts. It was all DOE funding going through Penn State to CMU with all the other concerns. We did a huge amount of reporting. Some, at some point, it got to be weekly reporting on what we were doing. We said, are you kidding us? NSF asked you for once a year reporting. And DOE says, oh no, we wanna know monthly. And this was like weekly, we were reporting out, here's what we're doing. It was huge though. Erica Cochran, one of the faculty you may know, was, was our uh, lead in, uh, in uh, person in Philadelphia where this hub was located. There were a couple of other Philadelphia universities including UPenn and uh, University of Philadelphia. Okay, so now back to the uh, Adaptable Workplace Lab. Uh, USGSA has been our longest standing funding. Now, uh, I, I would argue that if you're gonna get federal funding, it's all about personal relationships. You have to spend time in DC, you have to get to know the people, what matters to them, and, then, and now they're, luckily, they're calling us in August and saying, you know, if you can get us a proposal in the next week, we have residual funds in our fiscal calendar, which we have to expend by September 30th, and if you get the right proposal to us by September 1, signed through all the contractual processes of Carnegie Mellon, we will fund you for this coming year. Which means, of course, we're asking Jen Joy and her team to figure out how to get all that paperwork signed and agreed upon contracts office uh, within a week, which is crazy. But they had funds that had to be expended and we were long-term partners that they knew we would do good work. The work that they're asking us to do is twofold. We've done, in addition to the Adaptable Workplace Lab, which was a very early project where we helped them design their own living laboratory, they're now building their second generation of living laboratory, not with us, they're doing it on their own. Too bad, we think we have more insights to give them. Um, the two things that we do for them is data analytics. They keep throwing data at us. Here's energy data, here's water data, here's indoor environmental quality data. Do data analytics. And I've got a whole host of, we have in architecture, a whole host of graduate students who have been taking all kinds of data management courses. They're totally into machine learning. They definitely think data mining is part of the future and they're happy to be partners on this project. We just delivered uh, two reports in the last three months. And on the left, we do a lot of post-occupancy evaluation um, where we basically go in and we measure envi environmental conditions in buildings and we assess whether the buildings are working well. And the exciting thing about going into buildings, I truthfully believe that everybody should spend time in existing buildings because it is such an eye opener to know how they actually function over time or not. And that we really need to learn from our own failures and successes before we start to say what's the next, next generation of design. And we've learned a lot about things that work and don't work and truthfully, I fight for operable windows at Carnegie Mellon on every project CMU builds, I'm fighting to keep operable windows. Uh, it's just killing me to have to ask for uh, windows that open, but truthfully, if you want to have health and productivity and you want resiliency, you better have windows that open, right? So we've got a lot of field data that help us to make that case about how important it is. Okay, the last one, and I'm sorry if I'm cutting into Golan's time. Um, the last project is sort of, it's interesting at closing the loop. Um, and Susie Lee is here with me. She's uh, my co-conspirator on this project. This is funded basically by the Smithsonian Institution, but they funneled it through the Construction Innovation Institute, which is, um, they have a membership as a consortium member in the Construction Innovation Institute, who then decide as a group who to fund research in. And CII, these are, again, sort of like the National Endowment for the Arts, these are $50,000 projects. These are small projects. Overhead shoes up, you know. 58, whatever we're at, percent of it, and the next thing you know is you have hardly enough money to, to support somebody, much less you know, do uh, academic buyout, whether it's for courses or for a summer month. But the project was fabulous, so it was sort of worth all the pain that went, went with uh, the inadequate funds because we were given access to the African American, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, NAMAC, as it's affectionately called, since that's too long a title to remember, um, in DC to all of their innovative systems. And our job was to demonstrate that the investment that they made in the innovative water system, truly innovative water system, innovative mechanical system, truly an innovative mechanical, and innovative con uh, envelope system, and, and um, 
layered conditioning system um, to prove that it actually made economic sense, not just in energy savings, which is your first bottom line, but in carbon benefit, which is your second bottom line, and in human benefit. And actually, a lot of the human benefit was just the sheer number of hours. This museum has double the length of stay of any Smithsonian in their suite. People stay six hours. When they come, they don't leave. And they don't leave for a lot of really good reasons in terms of the exhibits and the layout of the building, but they also don't leave because the environment is very conducive to minimizing what's known as museum fatigue. So it's literally, I feel like we've closed the loop on that very first project we did with NEA many, many years ago. So that's sort of the stretch of federal research that we've had, and again, it's not me, it's a team of faculty working a hell of a lot of proposals. I would argue it takes 10 proposals to get one funded, but once you finally make the connection to lead federal age, uh, you know, leaders in the federal system, all of a sudden it, it's not one in 10, it's one in two, right? We have a much better track record when we're working with the agencies and the leaders in those agencies. Now I have a few that are retiring from GSA, so which sort of says, uh-oh, we're gonna have to fix, find the next generation. Anyway, that's it, thanks guys. Um, so. I would now like to introduce Golan Levin, who is an artist, engineer, researcher, I'm a professor of art, that's good. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Don't do a bio. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, uh, we got slides? Okay, great. I'm, uh, as Jen Joy mentioned, I'm a professor of art. I am formerly the director uh, for 14 years of the Studio for Creative Inquiry that you're in, uh, and it's my incredible pleasure to see that the studio is doing so incredibly well under the directorship of uh, Nick Ross and Harrison Apple and their wonderful staff like Bill and Carol and Linda. Um, this is an amazing resource here at the studio for, uh, at, the, at CMU to help especially faculty in the CFA um, and whether it's just you know getting a little advice or potentially uh, helping you actually with the logistics of your research uh, the studio is uh, an important part of the uh, research apparatus of the college. Uh, the other part, of course, is Jen Joy's office, um, which sort of handles all these grantee grant things. And um, I'm here today to talk to you about, uh, well, Jen Joy asked me, you know, Golan, you have so much experience getting federal money. And I was like, I don't have any wisdom to offer. Uh, and Jen Joy was like, no, 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 really, you've gotten so many grants, let's, you know, share your, your wisdom. And I'm like, okay, what can I actually share that's maybe useful? Um, so, First of all, I, I actually think that I'm going to present a lot of fairly obvious in information. So just to summarize my talk in a, in a single sentence, do good work, speak with grants officers, stick to the character limits, and fight the bureaucracy at CMU. That's kind of like, you know, most of it. Um, uh, there are some wrinkles to getting support uh, for your work, though. Um, and uh, my main experience doing this with federal funds, um, I got a $12,500 grant from the NEA to help realize this book, which is a... Uh, a book uh, for um, new media arts educators, sort of, a, sort of a teacher's guide to teaching new media art, and uh, I, I got in collaboration with the uh, collaboration and support from the uh, Carnegie Museum of, of of Art down the street uh, a seventy some odd thousand dollar grant from the National Endowment for Humanities to make the interactive project you saw by the door, which is a sort of inter uh, interactive visualization using a lot of machine learning techniques of the life's work of Charles Teeny Harris. It's this, that big touch screen by the door, which um, is a browser for some 80,000 images that have been analyzed by our machine learning techniques into sort of some kind of semblance of order. Um, so this is just actually a pretty quick presentation of what I think is a sort of hopefully obvious checklist of stuff to do, but I'll, mostly I'm gonna kind of make some commentary on it as I go. Uh, so. First of all, some general mechanics, talking, Bill Rogers. That's the word general underneath the word there. Uh, I don't know what that, what, what's that doing there? Yeah, I know, but okay, it's just, all right. Uh, it's just, it's, it's overlay graphics is, is, I wasn't expecting it. Okay, uh, so here's seven points, right? Research the agency's priorities. If you're gonna apply for money, you know, look at what they're, what they're, interest in supporting. They have websites, they are really clear about um, what they're trying to do. Uh, they're, they're super clear about what, they, what they're looking for, so um, make sure that your proposal aligns with their goals. 
Uh, understand the application process. Um, this is something where you can't talk enough to Jen Joy. Jen Joy was like, oh no. But, <laughs> but I mean, the, the application process has a lot of wrinkles to it in terms of like some back and forth. And uh, it's actually particularly arcane within Carnegie Mellon. I, I, one of my other points is that in general, the feds aren't the problem. They are paid to give money to you. Um, that's what they exist to do. They really want, and they have to give away the money. So they, they you know, the problem is actually us, as, as I'll make clear. Us, Carnegie Mellon, and I'm, I'm, I, I mean sort of outside of this room, outside of this, outside of this building, uh, but it's definitely us. Um, every time it's gotten really messed up, it's because of, it's because of us. Uh, develop a strong proposal, like do good work, you know? Uh, and make sure that you are, you're all super bright, y'all are, you know, on your, well on your way to getting tenure if you don't have tenure already, and, you know, you should articulate your project's goals, methods, and expected outcomes, like how to do good work, everything you tell your students, it's just like do good work. Include a realistic budget. Um, actually, this is super important, don't overpromise, right? Like, it's actually good to kind of um, scope things well. Uh, build relationships with program officers. Vivian mentioned this, and I think it's, uh, it's really important. Um, in, in both of the cases that I was mentioning, this NEA grant and the NEH grant, um, you know, e either I already had relationships with uh, the grants officers or developed them in the course of the project. So find out who is the grants officer and either speak with them directly or with their people. Um, they have a small staff and they'll, you know, the, the staff is ready to answer your questions and they can kind of give you a vibe uh, check on your project. Um, in the case of, uh, of this project, you know, the NEA is a small community and, and the, the the person there who is the, the grants officer for New Media Arts oversees a program that's you know directly supporting my field, um, and you can bump into her at conferences that are, you know are in my field. Like Nick and I both went to a conference, and you know she's there or whatever. It's, it's like you can talk to these people, and and it's really helpful for them to be, become familiar with who you are and what you're up to, and um, they will they will want to cultivate good proposals. So it's on it's in their interest to. Um, to meet you. Um, uh, seek feedback from your peers. It's really important to get another pair of eyes on your projects, so please depend on each other. And you know, be persistent. Um, it does take a few tries sometimes. Um, so review criteria. Uh, the organizations are really clear about what they're looking for. Uh, in the case of the NEA, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about right now, um, you know, artistic excellence, public impact, feasibility. And fourth, but sort of implicitly, not explicitly stated, is good sense. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of get, I'm just going to kind of quickly sort of tack off like what are these, right? So artistic excellence, like demonstrate artistic excellence, like they, you know, want to make sure that they're supporting good work. Uh, be clear about the artistic merit of your project or creative merit or how it contributes to the development of your field. Be sure to clearly explain how your project will demonstrate artistic excellence uh, and advance the field. Uh, show a track record of success. You have to, you know, do your portfolio and your resume. Uh, include strong letters of support. Very essential, especially from partners. Uh, but partners I'll talk about uh, next. Um, so their funding priorities, in particular NEH, NEA, they are really interested in prioritizing projects that promote access to the arts, particularly for the underserved and under underrepresented communities. It's a really big win if your project, if you can make a, make a, a claim to that. Um, in the case of, uh, of the Teeny Harris project, it's more clear, you know, you're working with a museum that has an archive of African American photography from the 20th century. It's like talking about Jim Crow and talking about uh, the civil rights era and it's for a public, you know, um, facility. It's really gonna encounter the public, it's quite clear. In the case of, uh, of this community, there hadn't been a book for this particular audience before and, th and the, this audience is teaching to programming to new audiences themselves, uh, you know, not in computer science programs typically. So, find a way to either articulate or to make sure you sort of have a good understanding of uh, how your project reaches the public. If, it, if, it's, if it's really arcane and not reaching the public, it's gonna be a harder sell. Um, they do support some really, you know, um, uh, lofty work, uh, but it, it, it's, it, they really wanna see it reach a public. Uh, yeah, I think that's the second one. And then uh, work with partners is really, really important, you know, um, Someone here mentioned they were uh, working with uh, with public schools earlier, or it was Susan Rapone, uh, working with, with public schools. We worked with the museum down the street. You know, it, Vivian's worked here in Pittsburgh with the city's office and others, you know, it, it the mayor's office rather. It's um, it's really great to have partners. They, having partners bolsters the strength of your, of your proposal. Um, feasibility, have a realistic budget, demonstrate sufficient planning and preparation, you know, 
demonstrate sound management. And good sense, this is like, you know, the character limits are actually really real. So I know this seems really obvious, but like like a lot of, the grants officer told me a lot of proposals get, get canned uh, because people just don't fill out things out, think, fill things out correctly. Um, they do have um, workshops and webinars that are uh, worth it worth uh, attending if you get on their mailing lists or, or you know, these get on these folks' mailing lists, like the studio or Gen Joy. These folks will have webinars where you can kind of attend a Zoom call and uh, not only hear what the priorities are for their funding for that year, but also get um, get to actually see in the Zoom the people, write down their names, you know, maybe speak to, speak to them in the Q and A or contact them afterwards. Um, and then that's where you can find out the program staff to contact them. Um, I'm reminded that uh, oh, what was I going to say? Um, oh. Something I, I forgot to say earlier, in terms of um, sort of researching the agency's priorities, one of the best things you can do um, in terms of uh, getting support here, uh, look at the lists of people that they support every year. They publish them. I was looking at the list of uh, grantees from the specific programs that uh, I had applied to. And uh, actually, so, so that's the sort of end of my, my slide presentation, but the, some now some, just some quick anecdotes. Um, the NEA would publish a list of who their grantees were. And I had applied for media arts. And uh, so I was like trying to, you know, do some kind of interactive media art involving computers and programming and computation. And I looked at the list of the people, that I, I got rejected. And I saw, I was like, oh, I got rejected, man. I thought I had a pretty good proposal. Like, what's going on there? Um, and uh, I looked at the list of people that they funded. And at the time, in 2014, 2013, what they called media arts was specifically film festivals. It was like 97% film festivals and one project restoring a Nam June Paik project. Like, that was like, that, that, that's what it was. It was like, oh, you think media arts is like 20th century media arts. Where's the support for 21st century media arts? There wasn't. They actually said, we think you'd have a better chance if you reapplied and sent this to the artist community's uh, 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 program rather than the media arts program. I was like, Okay, and actually I did, and ended up getting a grant through me, through through the the artist communities program, which is not something I would have thought. I would have thought that I should be naturally funded with the media arts. I wrote a public letter. I was like, y'all should you know have com computers at least partially represented in media arts. And when the new program director was hired, uh, she ended up seeing my letter, contacting me out of the blue, saying, "I saw your letter, your public letter about how the NEA should be including things like computers in the topic and category called media arts." And I was like. Yeah, she's like, I really agree. I was like, that's great, and you know, that's how we started a relationship. Is 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 um, you 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 know, you sort, but you have to know what the priorities were. And I I was thinking media arts was something that involved computers. You know, fuck me, like <laughs> no, not not at the time. Um, other anecdotes. Uh, the money is small, right? This was a a twelve and a half thousand dollar grant to do this. Um, how did this get complicated? You know, it should seem obvious that a professor who wants to create a book uh, should get support, uh, both from external funders, if it's, a, you know, if it's worthy, and uh, internally uh, from the university. Uh, the university made this so complicated, you know? Um, uh, first of all, just some general stuff. You have to have a match if you're applying to the NEA or if you're applying to the uh, NEH. You have to find half the money from somewhere else. They wanna, they wanna see half the money uh, from some other source. So that could be, for example, you know, the dean's, run, or the dean's fund here for, fun, for the Fund for Research and Creativity. It could be potentially a FERF grant from the Studio for Creative Inquiry. It could be um, other grants that you might arrange from local foundations or from, uh, from trustees who like your work or whatever it might be, but you have to find half the, half the funds. Um, so it, it, that's sort of like, a lot of fun that you don't get to have because you are you're like I how am I supposed to find half the money? But the NEA wants to see that and the NEH as well. Um, so then, uh, and this is where where Vivian was like that the, the university will take fifty six percent. So <clears throat> if you're hapless enough to be applying to money from like the Office of Naval Research, yeah, just you're gonna, you're going to lose two thirds of your money. Forget it. Just like right off the top, the university be like, "Oh, Office of Naval Research, DARPA. Forget it. You're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna take two thirds of what you do." The university could and has, but has has changed its kind of willingness to like look the other way um, on the matter of NEA. 
right? What was what, what, what did the university didn't 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 take didn't take fifty six percent of this, right? Am I not supposed to say this on camera? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to some of this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so the NEA does not allow, in the past, did not allow for indirect costs, and so it was at 0% for a number of years. In the more recent years, I would say maybe two, maybe three years ago, they started, if, because basically what it was, was they would only, you could not apply a research rate, and CMU's negotiated indirect cost rate for the federal government is a research rate, because the bulk of what we do falls in that category. The NEA work does not fall into that category. So in the past, that caveat allowed us to not charge any indirect costs on the NEA. But now the NEA has a, um, they will allow us to charge the de minimis. So it's 10% on NEA. Um, so they're, they're tithing you, but at least you're not taking 65%. Right, and to be clear, it is not, even when it is at the 63%, which Excuse is the me. maximum rate, <laughs> even that only works out to about 33 cents on the dollar, it is not Two thirds of your funding, just to be clear, um, because <laughs> because of the way it's charged on your direct costs. So that all gets into the math that my office will help you with that you don't actually need to learn or worry about, um, unless you're really really interested in it. Um, so don't stress about that part. Quite in my much. experience, and this is where it gets super interesting, the things that the uh, NEA and NEH specifically will allow, and the things that the university here thinks that they won't allow because they're so inured to working with DARPA, um, are really, really quite divergent. And this is actually really important to know about getting, sort of funding, getting funding here. Okay, we are chicken shit compared to the millions of dollars that are coming into this university for designing weapons, right? And so people who are getting grants on the other side of campus to make those kinds of systems are um, bringing in such huge amounts of money, and that those dollars have to be inspected incredibly carefully, all right? And so this, the amount of scrutiny that's applied is really high, and they're accustomed to a certain way of working over there. When we kind of roll in with, with like, our, like a dinky grant from $12,500 from the NEA, here's the problem. They apply all of the same uh, uh, sort of mindset. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar or a million dollars. They apply exactly the same mindset, and we represent like one-tenth of one percent of the kind of, you know, stuff that's coming across their desk. So they can't really sort of have a separate mindset for like working with the arts. They just apply the same mindset. And so it's... So I am going to stop you there. So we have a new vice president for research who, from what, and just based on recent and very, very young <laughs> conversations, it sounds like she is less risk averse than our past vice presidents for research. So I do think that you will see positive things in that direction, for one thing. Um, that's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's it good is. news. It's that's good very news. exciting. Yeah, yeah. And for another, we are here to help you lobby. So whenever it does get into those complexities with the lawyers mm. over there, like I went with Golan over to a meeting in OSP at one point, like we will help you get through those. Jen Joy's like, shut up. And the, book, <laughs> the book is here and it's funded. I just would like to point that out it right now. <laughs> it's liability and intellectual property. There are two things that can hold your contract hostage for months. Having conversation, uh, yeah, where yeah. The money will disappear in the federal structure, so it kills me when they keep saying, "Well, you're going to lose intellectual property." Did, really, there's nothing here that anyone can steal. Just let it go, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it uh, it can be challenging, and this is actually just a point to please talk to us early and often because we'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but, but so so for example, um, you know. Instead, uh, we, of, we, 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 instead of getting into this, though, why don't we allow the audience oh, yeah, to sounds pose great. their question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. uh, uh, is there, I mean, is there I still, something I, that you I, need to say yeah. before we do that? Uh, nothing I should say. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let's, see if, let's see if we have questions from the group. Uh, so my question, and I think something both Vivian and Golan alluded to, was the importance of par partnerships with federal funders. Sometimes you find yourself in the lead position. Sometimes you may be a sub awardee. Um, can you, and, and this may be more of a, uh, a question for Jen Joy, knowing that um, getting in with some of these funding agencies is important. Some faculty members here might find an easier way of getting in by attaching themselves as part of a group project outside of CMU or et cetera, et cetera, with, with a working group uh, and then pursuing funding independent funding down the line. But is there is there anything that anyone who might be interested in working as part of a group on a federal grant 
should know as a sub awardee that would be different than taking the lead? Is there? I mean, I think the most important thing is to know that when you're a sub, it's essentially the same exact process. So it is just as necessary to work with our office and for us to help you with your budgets and because they will require the same exact documentation. So we, when we have sub awards on our awards, the sub essentially applies for a grant almost to us. So when Vivian is working with groups that are outside of CMU or some of our others are, they, the sub fills out their paperwork with their own budget, their own activity, and that comes to us and it would work vice versa the same way. Uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I think there's a real advantage to tying yourself to another long-term successful. If I were starting out again, right new now, I would probably, in the area that I'm focusing on, probably try to see if I could find people in civil engineering that are looking at high performance, you know, innovation and control systems and building, you know, um, infrastructures and things that are areas of expertise, or even in computer science because they have an entree. I have to say, if you, we have had very little success with the National Science Foundation. We did have a sustaining administrative um, uh, support for almost a decade, but it was purely a $50,000 add-on to our consortium to make it a industry university collaborative research center. And every time we apply directly to NSF, and these are huge proposals. It's a great funding stream to have because when you get an NSF budget, you also get the ability to apply for direct PhD uh, and graduate student support. There's a separate line of money that comes along. You can also apply for an infrastructure grant attached to your, your original grant. So it opens so many doors, but we, we have not been successful at it. And I think a lot of it is every time we uh, compete, it comes back to you know, we really don't fund schools of architecture. And we're going, you know, why not? I mean, we're, you know, at this point, we're now a STEM. It took us a long time to be a STEM degree. Uh, we're now a STEM degree within the National Science Foundation, which is great, thanks to Ramesh Krishnamurti, who fought like crazy to get us STEM designated. Um, but it's still, all the technical reviewers on those contracts for NSF look at it and say, yeah, School of Architecture, they don't really have the expertise to do this work. So all, if I were starting out, I would be building my collaboration friendships on campus or on other campuses with engineering and computer science and business and have them be the lead PIs and be a co-PI. And then once you have a relationship, you can start to be the lead. So I would agree with you. I think that's the key. And I will just also add that right now I am working with the other associate deans for research on campus to explore how to hold workshops to connect faculty from our college with faculty in the other colleges on campus. So that is in the works, but it's still in the very early stages. Any other questions? Uh, let, me, um, let me suggest another, um, many of you know Bob Bingham, um, there was a, a whole series of years um, uh, in RACO and I mean there were just a group of people through the studio that were looking at watershed design and literally design, right? And it was just a, 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 an aggregate of people from many disciplines doing really visionary work uh, that helped actually uh, make Nine Mile Run what it is today. I mean a whole series of results that occurred. Beautiful multi, you know, huge scale models. Um, I think in the area of sustainability, we, we, have, we are hugely valuable to a broader con context. And I would hope, actually I've been trying through the Scott Institute to convince them to make you know, architecture and design and maybe other CFA disciplines integral in every proposal they send out because you know, they, they're talking about exactly the same issues. They're talking about what is the grid of the future. Well, you better have some people with urban design and, and grid expertise on that on, and design expertise so that you're not just doing something purely in a mathematical way. And I, I think we've undersold the power of CFA's um, uh, technical and creative uh, expertise and somehow maybe if you can make these happen, we can, we can become a critical part of all those.
Vivian mentions the technical and creative expertise, and I actually want to underscore a third, a third leg of the tripod uh, that we have here, and that's our circumbureaucratic expertise, uh, as embodied by Jen Joy's office and by the studio here, that um, so much of what you will need to do to get your weird project realized, particularly if it's in the arts or arts adjacent fields, is to kind of explain it to bureaucrats outside of the College of Fine Arts who don't necessarily know what they're looking at and are applying standards uh, that are maybe not applicable so well to your work and uh, that are applicable to other parts of the federal government that might have very different standards from the ones you want to work with. So the bureaucratic wayfinding to, to get through there, to get through to them uh, and to help articulate your project well uh, and get it to realize is that expertise is here in the college. It's, it's hard won. Thank you, Bolan. I yeah. agree. Um, and yes, it is true. Like we, I basically consider my office to be translators that we take what you do and that's then right. help to put it in the language that everyone can understand to help it get funded. Right? Like that's our whole goal. Um, and that's why we're here. So please, you know, come and talk with us, work with us. We will help you. Yes, there can be hurdles. Um, some of the hurdles can be avoided by having conversations early um, and negotiating contracts and things um, with that office in mind. Um, I, am very, I am very optimistic right now um, because with the new vice president for research coming in um, and also the associate deans for research at that level for every school is still a fairly new concept because they were only established just before the pandemic. And so they were established with this goal of helping to have everyone kind of work together and to build this activity. That's you and your counterparts. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and then they got caught up in COVID protocols and that's really all they were focused on was how to get research happening during the pandemic and we're not able to work in this realm. So we are, it is only really now that we're actually starting to work on that. So I do think there's gonna be a lot, you're gonna see an uptick in how that activity happens and how we can, CFA, you know, when Vivian and Golan are referencing how we're underutilized, that's like my favorite comment, is that we are not represented as well as we could be. And I genuinely believe that part of why we're not getting the centered proposals and the large, very large grants that could come into Carnegie Mellon is because they're not utilizing us because one of the biggest criticisms that we get is that it's not transdisciplinary enough and that we don't have enough, um, and the, the big idea thinking that comes from bringing the arts and the sciences together is something that I think is what's gonna make the difference at Carnegie Mellon, and that's gonna mean all of you. So please look forward <laughs> to working in that realm. Um, are there any other questions, concerns? We're getting close to time. Thanks you guys for coming. Any, did, nice were there to see you all. in the chat? Yeah. Thanks everybody, thanks for coming. It was good to see you. And thank you to our speakers.